I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your patience this morning. As you notice on Ash Wednesday and today, I've had some trouble with my personal microphone. It looks like we're picking up some signal from the ghost station. So that's new. <laughs> <laughs> so you may, I don't know if you're going to hear some announcements from the ghost station or not eventually. Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, but we'll get this worked out. So Wednesday's ashes are gone, washed off of our foreheads, but their darkness still stains our thoughts and spirits as we begin Lent once again. Those tiny grains of ash, like the darkness of sin, may have fallen into our eyes or down on our faces on top of our masks. Annoyed, we may have rubbed our eyes or brushed our cheeks. Maybe we tried to wash it off and the ashes got wet creating a big stain on our head right between our eyes. How can we get it off without looking insincere before we get into our cars and do errands out in the real world where most people don't even know that it's Ash Wednesday, where most people no longer remember the word Lent or what it means? Sin is like that most days. A bit of an annoyance, a speck in our eyes that must be rubbed away. And heavens, we don't want to talk about it. It's so annoying and embarrassing, that word, sin. Being reminded that sin still exists in each one of us can just be plain annoying. Not earth shattering, nothing really to worry about. It's just there hovering around the edges, picking at us, especially during Lent. Oh, we have 40 days to think about it. 40 long days and we're reminded to repent and be saved. Our hymns are reflecting it. The word Alleluia doesn't show up in our liturgy again until Easter Sunday. Is that what Lent is all about? If we were only to take a surface look at it or think of a few memories from Sunday school in our youth, if we had a desire to get it over with and get back to the real world, this might make it so. But look at our readings that we've just heard today. If we really pay attention to what we're hearing, there's a whole lot more light than we could see than darkness a whole lot more graciousness than punishment. Yes, we're reminded about the temptations of sin, but we're offered the unstopping gift of forgiveness and a chance to model Christ, which is a gift. Lent can help us go deep into ourselves. Moses' story that we heard today that Alan read was full of light. God has given the Israelites a land flowing with milk and honey. All they have to do is show a little bit of gratitude through their offerings. A land flowing with milk and honey is an image of peace and beauty. The people acknowledged their rescue from the Egyptians by the God who heard their cries of affliction. And then today's psalm says, he shall come upon me, call upon me and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. This is another image that should remind us that God continues to hear our cries, even when they're moaned from the depths of our sinfulness. At the beginning of Lent, we're reminded that we are not alone. God not only has not abandoned us, God is bound to love us, the psalm says. That even when we're focused only on ourselves to the point of sin, God is with us, ready to bring us right back into the light. God is ready to brush the ash from our faces. In our New Testament reading, Paul says the same thing to the Romans. The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. 
That is not only the word of faith, but the capital W word of God. You will be saved, he says. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Can there be any better news than that? Paul does put in front of us, though, one type of sin that we may need to think about during Lent. Because after all, the good news of salvation is reliant on the fact that we actually want to repent and return to the Lord. Paul drops a very salient fact. He says, there's no distinction between Jew or Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and generous to all who call upon him. I think that speaks to us of God's inclusion of all people. No exceptions. We might need to examine ourselves to determine how much we really want to include all others. And perhaps this is part of the ash that has fallen into our eyes. And we might need some help getting it out. You might need to read over and over again Jesus' words through the Gospels that call us to love our enemies. Our enemies. It's hard enough to love even our own family members sometimes. But if that ash is left in our eye, it could fester and make us blind. Blind to our responsibility to share God's love with everyone. This feels like a very good time to remember that for the Jews, love doesn't mean Valentine's Day card, emotional kind of love. Love, when Jesus talks about it, also means loyalty. We don't have to agree with everybody to love them. We don't have to have emotional love for the person or a communal group doing evil. Loyalty means, though, that we acknowledge that these two are children of God and that they need our prayers. They need us to want them to see the light, not for us to judge them as unworthy. And you'll notice that even Jesus didn't send his tempter immediately away in our gospel story today. Isn't it interesting that Jesus only responds to the temptations by reminding his tempter that God alone is worthy of our worship and our service? There's no argument, no discussion. God alone is our refuge and our stronghold in times of trial. The three temptations are interesting in and of themselves. Would it have been so wrong if Jesus had just turned a few of those stones into bread? Certainly there's no sin in that. So I wonder what Luke is really telling us. Perhaps that we might be tempted to want to manipulate the world to our liking? Something like that can grow into a serious sin. For example, not caring where our food comes from or the environment in which it grew. Sometimes I even wonder if we, if we care enough about those who grow the food we eventually buy in our stores to make deliberate choices about where we shop. Jesus' second temptation might make us think about what we feel we must own. What in our lifestyles come before our consideration of God? And if we're honest, many things can draw our attention away from God. Things that in and of themselves are not bad, but things such as that annoying speck of ash that fell into our eyes that might fester in us until we can see nothing else. I think the gospel reminds us that Jesus too was faced with temptation. We know that. 
He was, after all, fully human as well as fully divine. He knows what we face. He knows the power that tries to turn our hearts from God and how seductive that can be. Our ashes remind us of the same thing. But today, today, we hear words of grace. Today we hear about God's great love for us. And we're reminded even more about the fact that we abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We too have been promised a land flowing with milk and honey. There is a lot to be joyful about in Lent. Let's recognize the gifts of light, of grace, and of love that our God is offering us today. And receive them as we begin this journey hand in hand with the one who saves us. Amen. Amen.